Hello and welcome to this session. This is going to be really exciting because it's about decentralized finance. Not about a decentralized audience like we all are, but decentralized finance. The world of finance relating to blockchain, relating to uh, all those other different decentralized mechanisms. And is it going to be good or bad for us? Well, that remains to be seen, but we've got an expert who's going to guide us through the, um, some of the aspects of decentralized finance, DeFi as he calls it. And he is Iraj. Iraj Idafar is a committee member of BCS Central London branch. And he's an experienced IT business analyst with a demonstrated history of working in the telecoms industry, building cash flow, budgeting, business planning, internal audit and sales, and especially in SAP, FICO, the financial controls. So that's about Iraj, and I'll leave Iraj to introduce our other um, uh, presenter in a moment, but I want to just tell you that also we have David, David Grundy, the secretary and mainstay, cornerstone, I should say, of the Central London branch. So a lot of great colleagues in Central London branch, and I hope you're a BCS member, and um, we have many, many liaisons with BCS members, of course, especially with North London branch. So this promises to be a very interesting session. So, decentralized finance, lead presenter Iraj Idafar. As I say, he is an expert in a number of different aspects. Acts, for example, cash flow, budgeting, business planning, SAP, FICO software, and decentralized finance. Very pleased to hand over to Iraj. Thank you, Dalin, um, and welcome everybody to our webinar for this evening on decentralized finance. Um, I'd like to introduce you also to Giorgio Grumesti, who is a uh, computer science and uh, technology student at King's College University. Um, he's going to present the first part of the um, uh, webinar, primarily focusing on uh, the technology behind uh, decentralized finance, and I'm sure most of you have heard about uh, bitcoins and blockchain technology, so he will explain a little bit about how all of that works. Um, and uh, I will then um, take the, the part of the webinar that talks about uh, regulatory risks and uh, basically why we actually may or may not need a centralized finance system. So um, I'll hand over to Giorgio. Um, and uh, he will take over the presentation following a short introduction about himself. Okay, thank you, Arash. Good evening to everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, I just wanted to introduce the presentation to you all um, and just touch on why we decided to cover this topic. Um, I'm an aspiring investment banker, and I have a deep-rooted interest in the financial market and the implications of decentralized finance on the current system that we're using. Um, and bearing in mind all of the, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> we chose decentralized finance because we wanted to touch on all of the implications that it has on our current financial system and leading and lead on to answer the question of, can it change our financial system for the better? I just wanted to go and cover some common terms which we're going to be using. Sorry, my screen appears to have frozen. Okay, so DeFi, this is short for decentralized finance, and that is the provision of financial services through blockchain technology. And when we say financial services, that is a very umbrella term. So that can encompass transferring money, um, exchanging, exchanging different assets, different cryptocurrencies, and it can also, well, DeFi can also be used for derivatives and futures, 
which I'll come on to later. But in essence, those are very sort of niche. Um, it's a very niche part of the financial sector where only professionals would be interacting with those kinds of products. Now, a smart contract is code deployed to the blockchain to implement what's called a DAP. And that's our next term. Well, the smart contract is the underlying code which will allow a user to interact with this decentralized application. So that will, so if you think about it in terms of a website, the smart contract could be the JavaScript and the PHP and the MySQL powering that website. So it lets you effectively click all the buttons, it's all the links embedded in there. So it's effectively the guts of the app. Now the DAP itself is the user interface which allows the user to use its functionalities. So that would effectively be what it looks like. And the user would then be able to make use, able, <clears throat> the user would be able to make use of whatever that smart contract is allowing them to do, be that transferring money or exchanging different commodities. A blockchain is a public ledger, and the smart contracts are actually deployed to this blockchain, and, and the blockchain will contain a public record of every transaction or movement of money for that particular network. So most of the applications of DeFi, which we're discussing, are hosted on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and so that's what we're going to be focusing on mainly, but there are various other blockchains chains which are which have DeFi applications not so much the bitcoin network because that's mainly just transferring value but there are other ones such as uh, cardano which is a very big competitor to ethereum which can be effectively viewed as providing similar functions um but that's a different topic because they both have different approaches of doing stuff but we're here to focus on the exact functionalities of ethereum based DeFi. Here's a diagram which we've compiled illustrating how a centralized financial system would go about would go about providing a service to a customer or a client or a user. And underneath here we'll have we have a diagram showing how a decentralized system would go about doing a similar function. So with a centralized system, it would use what's called a clearing system, and that's with a lot of commercial banks. Of well, all commercial banks. So if I wanted to send money to Iraj, the I would go onto my phone or online banking, say input a pound, and that clearing system would ensure that money goes safely and securely from my bank account into Iraj's. The intricacies of it are not important, but the principle is there is one centralized entity which is handling that transaction. Now with a decentralized system, any number of volunteer nodes or computers um, would host the smart contract, which is the code that would ensure my Ethereum or any Ethereum based token would arrive from my wallet into another person's wallet. And that could be any number of people, such as other users of the DeFi application. And really, we don't know who that could be. It could be anybody, because when you're, say, for example, exchanging Ethereum for another token, any person who takes you up on your offer or accepts the exchange rate would transfer, it would exchange money with you. So this, this laptop, this laptop, or any device on the Ethereum network could be interacting with you and the smart contract would facilitate trade between you and this other counterparty. So what exactly is decentralized finance? So as we mentioned earlier, it provides financial services and instruments, much like a normal institution would. However, there is no reliance on centralized entities like commercial banks, building societies, clearing houses, and brokerages. And to elaborate on that, uh, most of the financial services um, are provided by a small number of big organizations, such as Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, 
uh, Deutsche Bank and a, a different um, arm of HSBC and Barclays. They do provide financial services for high net worth individuals and large companies. Um, they would go about doing that using traditional methods, um, but DeFi uses blockchain technology and this is mostly done using Ethereum. So the functions of the traditional financial services industry um, fall into the following categories. Financial intermediation, and that is reducing transaction and information costs by selling products, which would allow people who want to save money, such as anybody who has money they want to invest, and they would take that money and do what the client wants them to do with that money. So for example, if I have, for example, 10,000 pounds, and I want to buy shares in a company which is not listed on the stock market at the moment, uh, I would go to a private bank and they would be able to do that for me and take a fee. So that is financial intermediation. Pooling and managing risk. So risk is essentially money which can be lost or it's, it's risk, it is at risk. Um, the financial services industry allows money to be pooled and managed using either products or contracts. So pooled products allow multiple savers to become investors um, by grouping all of their money together and buying different shares or financial instruments with that, aiming to make a return. Risk can be transferred between two counterparties using derivatives. Uh, an example I can give you now is uh, the use of options. So if I were to buy uh, an option, that could give me the right to buy a certain asset at a predetermined price. And the person who has sold me that option has to fulfill that, um, has to fulfill their obligation. So if I want to buy one share of Apple at $100, and I have the option to do so, the other counterparty has to sell me a share of Apple for $100. And depending on the price movements, that can become very profitable or very unprofitable for those counterparties. So that is how risk can be transferred between two people. The financial system also allows people, or also allows, also provides a service called portfolio management. And that is where somebody would take a large sum of money to a firm and have them invest in whatever that company specializes in, aiming to make a return. So if you don't want idle cash sitting around and being eroded due to inflation, you would aim to make a return through a company. Um, but this is really only for very high net worth individuals or large companies with sums of upwards of £100,000 to invest. The most common services provided through decentralized finance are exchange or automated market making. So when you, so an exchange would match a buyer and a seller and a similar function is achieved through apps like, or dApps I should say, like Uniswap. However, instead of using an order book system, they use something called liquidity pools to determine an exchange rate. And that is in essence what automated market making means. Lending and borrowing. So if you were to approach a bank for a loan, they would be lending you money and you would be borrowing. A simple, well, an, a very popular dApp on running on Ethereum is called Aave, allows collateralized peer-to-peer -peer lending. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer meaning my node, um, interacting with another node, which could be anybody operating. Anybody could be operating that node. And um, the, the lender would basically accrue interest, much like a bank would. And that is all facilitated through smart contracts running on blockchain. Derivatives exchanges. So I gave you an example earlier of an options contract, and those can be exchanged or bought and sold 
uh, through decentralized platforms. In the traditional, in the traditional sense, um, with private banks and financial services firms, um, they don't actually do a lot of business uh, trading, um, buying and selling derivatives, because a lot of derivatives are bought and sold over the counter, which is actually decentralized but they're not done through blockchain. They're just done through smaller, smaller firms and houses which would facilitate those, um, facilitate those trades. Discretionary portfolio management um, is yet to exist as a DeFi service um, simply because that would entail a lot of face-to-face -face interaction and really determining what the client wants. Uh, that's impossible to do through a computer screen when you don't even know who you're talking to. Anybody giving portfolio advisory has to be very qualified and strictly regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. <clears throat> Decentralized applications, as we, as we mentioned earlier, are what the user interacts with to make use of the services that it renders to them. So it can be lending, derivatives exchange, or intermediation. Smart contracts are what allows the app to do so. Once that, once that is deployed to the blockchain, that is accessible for anybody who is a participating member of the blockchain. So, now, so that smart contract will effectively be synchronized between all of the nodes and accessible by anybody with an internet connection. Uh, one thing I would say, or I will say now, is that once a smart contract is on the blockchain, it cannot be changed. So it can be very problematic if there's erroneous code, and that could have catastrophic implications, as we'll see later. Some of the benefits which decentralized finance can provide for users is open and accessible services to anybody with an internet connection. Um, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say discrimination, but their clients of private banks are very heavily scrutinized. Um, and that's for reasons like anti-money laundering and know your customer policy. However, anybody can, can lend money through decentralized finance. Anybody can borrow or facilitate exchange. And for this, for this reason, it is an alternative to some of the current services we have. There are no restrictions on the types of financial products one can buy. And this is quite significant because people like you and I are called retail investors. Um, we may have less resources, less time than somebody who works for an institution. And because of the strict regulation we have in the UK, we are actually unable to buy certain financial products. So you would not be able to buy an options contract or a derivatives contract unless the FCA deems you qualified or authorized. Um, however, with decentralized finance, that doesn't exist. Anything which is offered through that particular DAP or particular smart contract is accessible without any, without any discrimination or scrutiny as to who you are. Uh, you can just buy or sell that product freely. Um, and perhaps the most important feature of DeFi, or the most significant one, is they're totally anonymous or theoretically, in the sense that the only thing visible about you as a client or a user is your wallet address. Um, and because of that, it is quite secure. <clears throat> now, potential, issue with these, potential issues with decentralized finance are as follows. And, uh, because the transactions and the code is immutable, um, all transactions are unable to be reversed. So if there's any mistake, you can't just call the bank as you would um, and cancel the transaction. The money is effectively gone forever. So there have been some instances where people would send money to the wrong address because one character is off and the money is effectively burned. Any erroneous DeFi applications are susceptible to attack. Uh, and loss of funds as a result of that. And that really goes down to the code being immutable or unchangeable. Um, so now companies which audit the smart contract 
um, exist to ensure that doesn't happen. They scrutinize the code and mathematically and pragmatically check that there is no way the code can be exploited. Sometimes, it, sometimes those things still happen, uh, which is why users need to be extra careful as there's no recourse in the event of lost funds. And all code deployed to the blockchain is open source and visible to anybody, which would therefore make it more vulnerable to attack. It's logical that if you know how an application works and you can see its inner workings, it would be easier to exploit those loopholes, which it may have. Any developer or developers of any decentralized applications can choose to be anonymous, leading to theft or embezzlement. And the wider implications of that is a, are a general loss of trust in decentralized finance. It's um, comparable to misconduct in the financial services industry, leading to public distaste or distrust in the profession or their firm, as you can see in many examples in the past. And due to the lack of regulatory protection, there's no way to recover your money if somebody steals it or your application or the application which you're using gets hacked. Or <clears throat> even, even more so in the case of ins insolvency, where somebody is not able to cover their debt, um, this is more prevalent in decentralized lending. Um, there's no way to take anything back. There's no liquidation process as there, would with a, as there would be with a company. Your assets are totally unrecoverable and there's nothing you can do about it. And this is the, by far the most important one. With contracts between two people or two companies or any number of counterparties, they're written in the English language. And that can be open to interpretation. And that's why lawyers with years of experience have to write contracts to avoid, to avoid any exploitation of those clauses or words. But with a smart contract, it's written using code, which means everything is executed in the literal sense of how it's written. That can be a good thing and a bad thing in the sense of, in the sense of there's nothing which can be changed about that contract. So it does exactly what it says it will do. This can, <clears throat> so smart contracts not being interpreted in, with any context can mean either, <clears throat> They can be, sorry, I've lost my words. Um, smart contracts not being able open to interpretation will mean there is no alteration of how they run, which can mean, oh, sorry, excuse me. That was, that was my part of the presentation. I would like to hand over to Araj now, who's going to discuss the more regulatory side of decentralized finance and the, and the implications which come with that in the case of a regulatory clampdown or, or other events which are similar. Thank you, Giorgio. That was uh, very informative and um, I hope um, uh, the audience um, understand kind of how decentralized finance works. One thing I would just like to add around decentralized finance or blockchain technology specifically um, is that what makes blockchain technology different um, is that it is the level of encryption that is used in the smart contracts and also uh, in the fact that the uh, asset, whatever it is, a cryptocurrency or um, other instrument is actually held on a public ledger, which means that its value is publicly recorded and unalterable. For all, those of you who have done work in the financial services industry, where you may have done auditing of systems, etc., that is a really important feature of blockchain technology. 
And it is one of the things that I think makes it such an interesting and exciting development, uh, primarily because of the security that it can offer. However, looking at the regulatory side of this, um, I think there are a number of issues that you need to look at. Um, can I just take a quick straw poll of uh, how many people, by raising your hands, are actually working in the financial services industry uh, who are on this webinar this evening? You can just press the raise your hand button uh, just to kind of... Okay, eight people. Okay, so about a quarter of you work in the financial services industry. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so um, those of you who have worked in the financial services industry or are still working in the financial services industry, you'll understand um, that uh, within the financial services industry, whether you are an insurance company, a bank, or in other regulated businesses such as um, solicitors firms or even accounting firms, um, we have to operate something called the know your client due diligence, which is essentially you need to establish, first of all, the identity of your client. And secondly, you need to identify if the source of their funds are actually legitimate and not obtained through, shall we call them, um, corrupt or uh, stolen uh, ways. So one of the key issues that um, we have with um, um, uh, blockchain technology is that a lot of it sits on the public internet. So from on the one hand, there is the assurance that the money is kind of publicly known about. Um, but on the other hand, because of the anonymity of the user, that essentially creates a problem uh, from a regulatory perspective, because how do you know that person is actually legally the owner of this cryptocurrency or financial instrument that's sitting on the blockchain. The only thing you have to link them with is a digital wallet. And basically, that can be transferred very easily to other people. And therefore, that poses a significant problem for the traditional financial industry. Um, I'll just flip to the next slide. Uh, just bear with me one second. So one of the um, key issues with um, the uh, decentralized finance, um, and I would say one of the reasons why decentralized finance has uh, come to the forefront of blockchain technology is that um, there are certain drawbacks with financial services firms. And I think we all have our gripes or have had our gripes at some point in time with our uh, financial institutions, whether they be our bank, our insurance company, or whatever um, we have chosen to invest in, like through stocks, shares, bonds, etc. So one of the, the key things that blockchain technology and decentralized finance offers is the ability to transact a, um, something very, very quickly. And I'm not so sure whether that is necessarily a good thing, primarily because as Georgia outlined, once you've executed a transaction, it's very, very hard to reverse it. In fact, it's impossible to reverse it. And I am sure all of you at some point in time have made mistakes with sending money to people or um, signed on a financial services agreement that you probably needed a bit more time to think about. And I think one of the key issues of this uh, decentralized finance um, is that it makes things move so much faster. And that's not necessarily always a good thing in certain circumstances. Um, the other uh, drawback of the traditional finance system, financial system um, is that it tends to favor people with lots of capital. So it's not always accessible to um, the average man in the street or woman in the street, primarily because all of the best financial instruments and high yielding investments are usually offered by banks and other financial institutions to people 
with a lot of money. And therefore, uh, essentially, you could say that the average person is frozen out of the market because they cannot gain access to that market without actually having a certain amount of you know, capital to start trading with. Um, the other key drawback is that um, financial markets tend to open at certain times. So I, those of you, again, who work in the financial services industry will know that, um, for example, if you're working in London, um, the Asian financial markets open very late at night, so around uh, 11 p.m., midnight. Um, and then uh, by the morning, when it is morning here in London, they tend to be closing. Um, and that is another drawback of the traditional financial services firm is that it's only open certain hours because it's staffed by people who have to maintain certain working times. And therefore, when you have a 24 hour uh, decentralized finance system, essentially you're not limited by time. People can globally trade 24 hours a day. Uh, and that is, I would call it a convenience, but not necessarily uh, something that, that may necessarily be good for society. The other uh, drawback of traditional financial services firms is that they do not always yield a high amount of uh, return for the uh, customer. And that's for two reasons. One of the reasons is that the financial services firm obviously has expenses to cover. And therefore, a lot of the yield from those financial products goes to those financial services firms by way of a, a commission, a fee, a management fee. Uh, in some cases, they're actually taking a risk uh, on the asset themselves. So there is also a bit of hedging that they do. Um, and therefore, they charge for that. And in addition to that, if you are um, buying financial services through a traditional investment bank, uh, you will usually be assigned an account um, uh, manager, and that account manager also costs the bank a lot of money. So you effectively pay for that through the returns and the transactions that you make through the financial services firm itself. Um, so... Those are kind of the traditional drawbacks, but we should also not forget that the financial services firms that today we are using actually developed many, many years ago. A lot of these principles were developed three, 400 years ago um, in the merchants that used to trade between Asia and Europe. Um, traditionally, the Venetian merchants uh, or the Genovese merchants uh, that used to trade between uh, you know, the two continents. Um, so we're, we're dealing with a financial system that has not particularly evolved very well. And I think blockchain technology um, and decentralized finance has the ability to be a disruptor um, if some of the um, uh, problems can actually be resolved in, in some way. Um, and I think moving forward, um, banks uh, and central banks are looking at this technology and seeing how it can improve their operations, how it can reduce their costs. But I think, uh, as we will explore a bit later on, there are still a number of hurdles to overcome. Um, and I think that is what is currently holding back uh, the rollout of decentralized finance. So the next slide um, is basically just a um, just a brief uh, kind of overview and um, uh, let's call it comparison between a traditional finance system and a decentralized finance system. Uh, so you can see that the traditional finance um, uh, firm will do things like intermediation, whereas in the decentralized, it's no longer there. In other words, they do not become a middleman in bringing a buyer and a seller together. Um, you've got the pooling and managing of risks. So you've got derivatives and futures exchanges. So again, when you're trading in derivatives, um, for those of you that do trade in them, um, banks and financial institutions, when they actually take a trade from an investor, will typically put an equal and opposite bet uh, and I use it a bet, uh, the word bet because that is what a derivative is. You're betting on a commodity or a currency or a share going up or down to a certain value. And so what banks do is they manage that risk by putting an opposite um, um, 
bet on that particular instrument or a trade so that if it does go the wrong way, they don't lose out um, as much as the, the customer who actually placed the bet. Um, if those of you who are perhaps old enough to remember, um, back in 1988, there was a trader called Nick Leeson who brought down a bank called Bering Brothers, uh, which was one of the oldest British bank in history by racking up um, uh, trades, uh, trading losses of around 750 to 850 million pounds. Um, and he managed to do that basically by betting on derivatives the wrong way. Uh, it went against him and he was continuously trying to dig himself out of a hole for a few months and actually ended up breaking the bank. Um, so that is, I think, a very important function that um, traditional financial institutions serve is by pooling and managing the risk and they are the experts at managing the risks therefore one should consider actually the value that that brings um, the other key thing but i think this one can be replaced very easily by decentralized finance is payments and settlements um, so those of you that um, kind of have worked in the financial services industry will know that when for example you try and transfer money between banks there is a clearing system called APAX, and um, that is basically your bank will transfer the money, um, and then at the end of the day, there is a clearing that happens, and all the banks exchange all the transactions with each other, and then let's say one bank will owe bank number two, uh, you know, 100 million pounds, and they will transfer that to them, and then bank two will owe bank one, uh, let's say 300 million, and they will send them the, the 300 million. And that is a process called clearing and, and settlement. And essentially, that process happens in many things, uh, ranging from banks to banks, um, settling their debts to uh, even governments having to do that. So imagine the British government uh, borrowing or exchanging uh, foreign, foreign currencies with other countries like, you know, um, let's say the EU countries or with uh, the US. At the end of the day, somebody has to receive whatever is the balance between those transactions. So that is one of the key things that I think decentralized finance can replace uh, quite easily uh, without it uh, creating any issues. Now, portfolio management is an interesting one because as Giorgio articulated, a lot of this um, is uh, primarily advice given based on a person's, um, let's call it, appetite for um, certain criteria. So if you are a person fortunate enough to have a big enough portfolio that an investment bank is looking after it for you, one of the things that you will know is you will have a regular discussion with, the, with your investment manager or account manager. And um, you, know, you will be discussing factors like how much risk do you want to take? How much of a return are you looking for? And that is something that I think without um, artificial intelligence, um, or um, applications that can actually harness past decision-making um, that decentralized finance has a bit of a gap in filling because, um, you know, your appetite for risk, your appetite for a certain amount of return is not something that is native to decentralized finance um, apps at the moment. And I think you can only build up that knowledge from, doing lots of transactions with a particular person or having a tool such as an artificial intelligence um, engine that will actually look at a person's investment behavior and then actually be able to advise. So I'm not at the moment aware that anybody has created such an application, but I would say that if we're serious about replacing investment banks and portfolio managers, then one of the key things we should be looking at um, is artificial intelligence. And I think that is one of the, um, let's say, potential growth areas of decentralized finance where people can um, look at uh, using artificial intelligence to develop portfolio advice. Um, which kind of brings me nicely on to the next uh, topic, which is regulation. Um, and regulation is very much at the forefront of a lot of this. Um, so you'll see headlines like we lost our life savings in a cryptocurrency scam and um, hackers stole more than $600 million from uh, a decentralized finance network then gave some of it back. Um, question for 
all of you is, um, are you willing to risk all your life savings? Because today, uh, with decentralized finance, that is unfortunately what you would be doing if you're investing or buying any product through that. Um, and there are several reasons for that. So one of them is that you are dealing with essentially peer-to-peer -peer with people. And so there is no central bank or any financial institution that is guaranteeing the, invest the investment instrument that you're buying. The other problem is that some of these platforms that are offering you cryptocurrency are actually not in the UK. And so if they're residing in a jurisdiction that has very weak regulation, then one of the challenges there is if you do get scammed somehow or the company does go bankrupt, uh, what is your recourse? You know, do you have any terms and conditions of business that you've signed? All of you will know that Every time you buy a product from a bank or you buy it from a, a financial institution, you sign up to terms and conditions of business. And those terms and conditions of business usually will have a clause in them that says that this contract will be determined in accordance with a certain country's jurisdiction. Obviously, in the UK, it would be UK. But if you're trading with a, an American bank, it would be the US. Now, one of the challenges with decentralized finance networks is that you have absolutely no idea where the person that you're dealing with is based and when you're actually um, implementing a contract with them to buy or sell something you have absolutely no idea um, how that is going to be treated if there was a dispute between you and that also is a key issue from regulators and central banks uh, perspective, because one of the key issues that banks today are worried about is money laundering. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard about um, the various fines that the big banks received in the US uh, a couple of years ago, like HSBC received a fine of 300 million US dollars. Uh, Standard Chartered Bank, I think, got fined somewhere around $125 million um, for basically allowing um, the funds to flow through their system from, um, let's call them governments that uh, ha had sanctions imposed on them. So one of the big issues um, of the decentralized finance networks is that there is absolutely no regulation at the moment. Uh, money laundering is a huge risk. And typically what tarnishes the reputation of uh, decentralized networks is that because there is uh, no regulation, um, it's often perceived by people that the people trading on these um, networks are themselves somehow, uh, for the use of a better word, dodgy, um, or a criminal intent is intended by them using these platforms and uh, you know remaining anonymous. One of the other key issues is the security of the um, uh, instruments that you're buying, whether it be cryptocurrency or um, it be a financial investment uh, contract. Um, there, as the previous headline showed, you know, uh, no network is infallible to, to hacking. Um, and no matter how good the security, somebody will always manage to somehow infiltrate it. And I think this is one of the big areas is that uh, it is all too easy for a technology platform. And those of you on this webinar who worked in technology will know that most equipment, devices, software will often come with default passwords to access it. And then it relies on somebody to change those passwords to be something more secure. Uh, there have been quite a lot of hacks in recent years uh, and attacks which have focused on kind of trying to second guess um, kind of which devices on a network are using default passwords. There is the case of the, um, uh, I can't remember his name now, but he's, uh, he's a 20-something 20, 20 year old uh, who had Asperger's syndrome and he managed, he managed to actually infiltrate and hack the US Defense Department's uh, computers because they had connected some computers with default Windows passwords on them. So that is something that is always a, risk in any IT system. And I think one of the key issues is that 
how can investors and people who are using these financial networks be assured that there is good enough security there that they don't lose all their money? Um, the other key issue, as we've already touched on, is jurisdiction. Um, and you know, what if somebody does steal your money, uh, but that person is uh, doing it from uh, some jurisdiction that we don't have a extradition treaty with? Um, how can the police arrest them? How can that how can that person be brought to justice and your money recovered? If the government of that country, for example, refuses to cooperate with the British or U.S. government to actually bring them to justice, and that is a, a, a problem that exists actually presently even with non-digital uh, uh, things as well. So imagine if you sold some goods um, and you gave credit to a company overseas and they did not honor and pay for those goods, try suing them. I think you'll discover that the effort of trying to sue them in their own local jurisdiction or getting a court judgment here in the UK and trying to enforce it on them in their own local country um, is a nightmare to say the least, uh, let alone um, in some cases, those courts will not even recognize it and they will just side with the local company uh, purely because of political reasons. So that kind of also brings into play um, compensation schemes. So in the UK, for example, banking institutions, anybody offering investment products is required to be regulated uh, by the FCA. Uh, the most well-known scheme is the FSCS, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, uh, which most banks and financial institutions offering um, consumer finance uh, belong to. Um, and that scheme, for example, offers um, people uh, up to £85,000 if a bank or financial institution goes into insolvency um, or for whatever reason they lose their investment um, through no fault of their own. So that is, I think, a key thing to do with regulation. You know, imagine if tomorrow a blockchain network collapsed, what would actually happen to all of that money uh, and value that is vested in that blockchain network um, purely because somebody either hacked it or let's say they um, could no longer pay for the upkeep of their servers that, that kind of maintain that financial network. So that is a, a, a big risk of decentralized finance. Um, the other key issue is that at the moment in the financial services world, there is a, a disparity between developed countries and underdeveloped countries. And essentially, you also need to look at that from a social perspective in that you know, population as well is, is a um, population disparity, I will call it, is also a big issue. So for example, um, elderly people today um, maybe are not as, as good with technology as you know, younger people are. And so um, if you were to remove traditional financial instruments like cash and made everything digital, how would they actually be able to access financial services? Um, some people are perhaps too old to even be able to, to use a computer or not want necessarily to, to use a computer. So by kind of decentralizing the whole finance system, you also remove um, that bridge that you know, certain sections of society have um, to be able to access financial services. Um, the other um, issue around underdeveloped countries and the disparity is in some places you do not have good internet infrastructure. And given that decentralized finance is an all digital platform or network, uh, without good technology infrastructure, essentially um, other countries who are less developed will not be able to um, be included in the financial system. And therefore, that has a lot of economic. Uh, downsides for countries that rely on trade um, and therefore if they're not able to access finance it is a bit bit of a problem for those countries. The other uh, regulatory risk is that uh, wealthier users can be easy targets um, and what that is really is that they can be targets of fraud, they can be targets of kidnap, they could be targets of many different things. Um, and essentially, because the public ledger contains uh, references to their wallets, 
it's not too difficult some, for some people to reverse engineer that and find uh, who the owner of that wallet is and essentially use that um, to extort money from them in various means. The other um, key risk of a decentralized finance network is data protection issues. Um, and again, there is a whole, uh, those of you who are involved with GDPR, for example, will know about data sovereignty issues um, where data is uh, generated in one country and stored in another where perhaps they do not have as strict a uh, framework for protecting data. Um, and I think that is a big, big minefield regulatory wise for uh, decentralized finance because you know, platforms will take personal details um, and you will have a lot of personal information on those platforms, but if it's not protected correctly, then I think there is a big risk um, that users data can be leaked, shared, uh, and many, uh, let's say, uh, things can be done with that data that perhaps they do not approve of. And again, they will have no recourse to anybody because there is no data protection in that jurisdiction. So without actually sounding too negative about uh, decentralized finance, I think we should also look at some of the positives of it. Um, so I think there is one of the key things that decentralized finance provides as an opportunity um, is that you are no longer dependent on uh, big investment banks. And again, that if, for some people, they would cheer about that, but so some people would actually feel that that will be the end of our financial systems if uh, investment banks did not exist. The other key part of decentralized finance is it would um, enable the removal of a lot of legacy systems that banks have. Again, those of you in the financial services industry uh, will know that banks uh, in some countries are trading with each other or clearing transactions with each other on technology that could be as old as 30, 40 years old, maybe even older. Um, and essentially by creating new systems new and removing all of that legacy technology that holds uh, you know, financial institutions back, you could actually start with a clean sheet of paper and basically bring into play um, the advantages of all this technology, but perhaps have a regulatory framework that uh, makes it um, more palatable from the point of view of regulators and also provides uh, the customer with some level of protection um, and um, kind of compensation schemes if they were to lose their money. But I think the key thing about decentralized finance is the technology behind it and the uh, opportunities that that provides, I think, are pretty uh, good. Uh, but I think there are still a lot of uh, areas where the technology is a bit weak. And I think we could, uh, we, we, I think we'll need to wait for some uh, companies to develop the technology a bit further before it can genuinely replace all of the functions of a bank. The other key part about legacy systems is that they drive processes within banks and financial institutions. And I think if you were to remove some of that legacy, you could also remove a lot of the inefficiencies in banks. Um, again, I do a lot of process consulting in financial um, transaction processing. And some of the practices uh, in some companies perhaps go back 20 years, 30 years. Um, and so by removing um, some of the old legacy technology, you also remove some of the practices and processes can become far more efficient. The other um, key opportunity that is provided by decentralized finance is that you can have um, a workforce that gets upskilled as a result. So whereas today you may have a lot of transactional people working in the financial institutions may be doing fairly menial, repetitive jobs. I think financial, um, sorry, decentralized finance systems can provide the opportunity for those people to use that experience and actually be upskilled to be doing something a lot more productive as well as being uh, perhaps learning new skills, uh, which eventually would lead to them earning more money. Um, again, I'm not so sure you would do away completely with uh, relatively unskilled people in financial institutions if you were to go completely decentralized. But I think um, certainly it provides an opportunity for people to get 
promoted into something that they will enjoy more rather than doing the same repetitive task over and over again. One of the other um, key um, benefits and opportunities provided by decentralized finance systems is the transparency and the auditability um, of the transactions. So because you're using a public ledger um, on the blockchain for this, um, essentially the record cannot be altered. You need to alter the record on multiple nodes, perhaps millions of nodes. And that is if somebody wanted to perpetrate a fraud, um, that would be far, far more difficult um, to achieve, especially given the number of nodes that they would need to hack and um, kind of try and change the record of. Um, it is statistically quite a difficult challenge, I would say nearly impossible. But nevertheless, um, I think some of the decentralized finance blockchain technology does provide banks and financial institutions with the, op um, with the opportunity of improving their audits, auditability of transactions um, and also makes fraud, internal fraud, perhaps a little more difficult to achieve by people who are looking, uh, you know, bad actors within the, within the institution. One of the other key things we didn't um, touch on um, as far as the auditability of the system is concerned um, is actually the scalability of, of blockchain technology. Um, so one of the key um, uh, opportunities um, or you could call them drawbacks of um, decentralized finance system is the amount of uh, computing power that you need to maintain the uh, public ledger. Um, some of you may or may not be aware about how much energy it takes to mine bitcoins, for example. It is a huge amount of technology uh, computing power that is needed. And at the moment, if you look at any of these digital um, platforms that are uh, making and trading um, cryptocurrencies, one of the issues they've got is the amount of computing power they need to mine enough Bitcoin or mine enough Ethereum, um, as well as the environmental challenge posed by that, which is the amount of energy that is consumed as a result. Um, and that is at the moment still a challenge for um, you know, developers uh, in scaling up the technology. The technology at the moment is not yet at a point where it can be scaled up to actually uh, replace entirely the existing financial uh, system. Um, I'd be interesting. I would be interested to hear your views on that because I think scalability is one of the things that is actually holding blockchain technology back at the moment. Um, but um, we we will wait and see what happens to. Uh, developments in computing. So, for example, quantum computing, whether that is the solution that we're looking for. Again, that is a technology that is not yet uh, fully matured. Um, and I think potentially uh, blockchain technology could then be scaled up if we have quantum computing uh, that is reliable and uh, is able to uh, support that uh, level um, of transactions. So, there is also some social implications of um, decentralized finance. Um, I think those of you in the financial services industry will also be aware of all the back office functions that um, are maintained by the banks and the financial institutions, uh, the teams of people within those organizations that need to do the compliance, they need to do the reporting. Uh, there is teams of people that support the customers, there's the IT functions, etc. Um, and I think there is potential there for a lot of job losses in the financial services industry, and especially here in the UK, where London specifically relies heavily on the financial services industry. Um, if you were to remove uh, all of the companies that currently um, provide jobs and um, income to people, you could see um, uh, repercussions for local economies as a result of that. Uh, and I think that is a, a social impact of decentralized finance. And I think that's not lost on governments and regulators. Um, and essentially, that is kind of one of the things that we should be bearing in mind before we jump to this new technology. The other problem um, is that we've already identified the gap between uh, older people uh, who perhaps are not so savvy with technology 
uh, and therefore may not understand necessarily how the, the whole thing works, could potentially be victims of fraud, could potentially be victims of theft, um, and you know there is no uh, system to compensate them for that. Also, given that decentralized finance relies on peer-to-peer -peer investments, um, there is no professional advice. So unlike your uh, independent financial advisor who is bound by the FCA to give you uh, genuinely impartial advice based on your requirements, um, by buying financial products using a decentralized finance system, you have no such protection. Um, and essentially, you could be jumping into something that you don't really understand and potentially could end up losing a lot of money in, um, which would wipe out a year, you know, your life savings. Um, more importantly, I think there is another thing that we should consider here, and this is very much the experience of Bitcoins, is that um, it does make the financial system um, a little more, um, I would say, vulnerable. Uh, to speculators. And this is also one of the reasons why regulators have a problem with decentralized finance, because regulators tend to use the centralization of, um, uh, you know, currency, banking transactions, etc., as a way to regulate the economy. Um, so a lot of you will be aware of the relationship between the, you know, the value of the pound uh, to other currencies and that, for example, um, would drive, for example, exports because the, the central banks of countries can reduce or devalue their currency to encourage their products to be sold overseas. Similarly, when banks uh, and governments are trying to regulate the economy, they will often um, use interest rates or something called quantitative easing, um, as has been the case in the 2008 financial crisis and also now with the COVID crisis, where you know, the central banks would then issue um, financial instruments, essentially printing money to release into the economy to stop um, you know, banks running out of money. Um, I'm not quite sure how in a decentralized finance system that would work, um, because you then don't have an authority that is able to issue um, um, you know, bonds or be able to issue currency or buy back currency or buy back bonds to kind of um, change its value or to inject money into the economy. But I think those of you um, who are involved in financial services will understand uh, that that can be something that uh, essentially can create a lot of instability in the markets um, as well as to governments. Uh, who may be relying uh, on those instruments to actually manage their economy um, and uh, the economic uh, activity in uh, in those in their own countries, um, and essentially that is, I think, one of the key things that you would lose by having a completely decentralized um, financial system. Um, the other key area um, to focus on, whilst we're looking at government and regulation, is how would government actually uh, guarantee um, a, a cryptocurrency or a crypto financial instrument. Today, you know, most central banks hold gold reserves that are used as their guarantee. Um, and therefore, with a digital currency um, or a, a crypto instrument, you wouldn't normally have um, any such um, backing. You would never have any um, asset from the government that is actually underwriting your digital instrument. So that again is something that um, I think is important because the value then is no longer dictated by the strength of that government or the strength of the uh, backing asset, but it's then purely controlled by speculation. It's controlled by uh, people saying they accept this currency or not accept this currency. So Elon Musk um, a few months back said that he was going to start accepting uh, bitcoins for purchases of Tesla cars, and all of a sudden, um, you know, the the price of Bitcoin jumped to over sixty thousand U.S. dollars. So again, you you could have events in the market, shocks in the market that come from, um, let's say, speculation, and therefore that speculation can be very harmful to economies. Um, but essentially, I think we still have a long way to go before. Um, decentralized finance can be a viable alternative. 
uh, but I'm interested to hear views uh, from the audience um, when we get to the question and answer session. So that brings to an end our uh, presentation. Um, if you've got any questions to kick off the um, uh, Q&A session, which uh, is going to be open for the next half an hour, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, if you wish to connect with me or Georgia on LinkedIn, uh, uh, you can see on the screen our LinkedIn profiles and we'd be happy to connect with you or chat with you on, on LinkedIn uh, about any questions you may have. Um, so I think we will open the floor now to questions and answers. Um, so would like to um, maybe if we start with the questions that have been already posted. Um, so I've got um, Freddie uh, who has asked the question, what happened on that serious hacking of blockchain where hundreds of millions got stolen? Any lesson learned? Um, so that um, 600 million hack uh, apparently 500 million has been recovered so far, um, but they're apparently still in negotiations with the hacker um, about the other remaining 100 million, which so far has not appeared. So it will be interesting to see how that uh, happened or, or how that plays out. But I think the lessons to be learned is that no system can be 100% unhackable. And anybody who tells you otherwise um, is, I should say, being very naive because in the same way that um, anybody can come up with uh, security that is difficult, uh, there will be somebody equally talented who can break that security. Um, and those of you in the cybersecurity world will probably be um, kind of uh, smiling and smirking about that one. But anyway, um, so I hope, Freddie, that answers your question. Uh, the short answer is that still the story is ongoing and I will, uh, I'll keep following it to see where, where it goes. Um, so we've got um, anonymous attendee who has um, posted the question, I am puzzled why lack of regulation is seen as a problem for a DeFi network uh, with regard to theft or hacking as it's up to users to look after their own keys. It's not a network issue as long as the DAP code is error free. A lot of people have lost funds in Bitcoin trading because they have not secured their own keys but the Bitcoin network has never been hacked. Um, I would say to that, yes, I agree with you um, uh, to a degree. Um, but then again, um, I think security and maintaining uh, you know, secure keys for some people is a challenge. Um, the other problem with secure keys is they are quite difficult to remember. So they're not like a password where people can remember them and often people will either put them on a computer somehow uh, or use, um, you know, I don't know, paper to record them maybe. I think they're too complex to put on paper, but essentially a virus or a malware could easily infect their computer and those codes can be uh, stolen. Um, so I think maybe the answer to that is finding more secure ways where people uh, can store their um, securities. Uh, but again, that is one of the, I would say, um, weaknesses of the security. Um, and as any cybersecurity person will tell you, often the threat uh, to any network is not from um, you know, actors from outside the network. Often it comes from people inside the network with weak passwords, um, you know, phishing scams where they readily click on links. Um, and often that is the, the problem with, with the systems that have been hacked. Um, so as I said earlier, I think Bitcoin technology, the encryption around it is quite difficult to hack, um, which is why you need so much computing power to mint new Bitcoins and other cryptocurrency. Uh, but I think it's very easy for people to, use, to lose their secure keys and essentially they could be the victims of fraud. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, the next one is from Sean. Um, so can I safely assume that governments don't like decentralized finance because it can't be taxed? Um, I think there is um, an answer to that one, is that governments are actually waking up now to um, cryptocurrency specifically and Bitcoin specifically. From a tax perspective, um, they are actually looking at them um, in the same way as they look at any other investment product. A 
apologies. Um, and essentially what they're saying, and this is guidance from HMRC that has been published specifically on cryptocurrency, is that if you are a person trading in cryptocurrency as an investor, um, and it is not your full-time job on a daily basis, uh, basically they'll look at it as, a, as an investment product and they will tax it accordingly. So, you know, in the same way that you would buy stocks and shares, um, you would be able to uh, buy cryptocurrency and if it appreciates in value, you will pay tax on it on capital gains tax. But if you're trading daily with cryptocurrencies and you're essentially doing the same as what a stockbroker does, then they will tax it as income. Um, but I think the challenges around uh, how they tax it is that it relies on information they can't get at. And jurisdiction is certainly one of the problems that they have um, in that you know, if you are declaring on your tax return X amount of um, Bitcoin uh, gains, but the platform that uh, is the exchange that you're working on is hosted in the Philippines, where the UK doesn't have the ability or HMRC doesn't have the ability to secure, uh, securely obtain that information like they can from your bank here, then essentially, yes, that is a problem for um, central banks and governments. They don't really have the jurisdiction to ask for the data and therefore it's difficult, more difficult for them to tax. Um, but I don't think that is the problem. I think the bigger problem, the wider problem is more around how they control money supply in the economy. Um, and therefore, uh, that is, I think, the bigger issue for them, as well as money laundering. So I hope that answers your question, um, Sean. Um, the next question we've got is scalability and energy use. Um, so um, again, anonymous attendee is uh, telling us that scalability and energy use is being addressed through developments in off-chain layer two transactions, like the Lightning Network for Bitcoin. Um, I accept that, and I think there is um, it is a changing landscape. And I think as time goes on, we may see that um, uh, there are uh, opportunities how on in in how we can actually uh, mine bitcoins um, offline, perhaps using less energy, maybe with more efficient um, computers technology that can actually generate the encryption um, a lot quicker. Uh, without using so much power. But um, I think as things stand today, um, it's still work in progress. And I think the scalability issue and energy use will not go away um, at least for another two, three years. Um, so that's kind of uh, my view on it. Um, we've got uh, Giancarlo who asks, what other blockchain protocols like Cardano are seeing growth in DeFi? And I'll hand that over to uh, Giorgio who can answer. Hi, Giancarlo. So in terms of other blockchain protocols, which are seeing more growth and, and recognition, uh, Polkadot is the other big one, which also stands as a competitor to Ethereum, partly because Polkadot's founder um, is the co-founder, ex-co-founder of Ethereum. Um, however, what I will say is in terms of the value locked on the native blockchains, uh, nothing comes close to Ethereum. And that's dominant and I don't see any other one taking its place in the near future. Um, one thing I would like to address is the anonymous attendee who men mentioned that they were puzzled by the lack of why the lack of regulation was seen as a problem for DeFi is uh, the regulator, the FCA in the UK has a duty of care and it has to look out for the best interests of people, of people in general. Um, it's not as easy as saying every man for themselves, you know, it's, uh, it's about ensuring that people who are less savvy with technology or are less knowledgeable um, as, to how to use, as, to, uh, as to how to use said technology are protected in the event of fraud or losing their private keys. Um, and another thing which the anonymous attendee mentioned was scalability. Um, the most promising solution which I've seen so far is EIP-1559 for Ethereum. And that has been shown to slash the gas fees for transferring Ethereum between wallets. However, that's been delayed now for a while. And I don't think it's going to be seen. I don't think it's going to be launched um, onto the mainnet for a while. However, it is very exciting. And if the scalability is done right, then it could be very promising for DeFi. Um, 
So Paul Hicks has asked, I've been tempted to do some research and recently read the book, The Age of Cryptocurrency, which makes some interesting and objective points. One is that the volume of unbanked individuals in the world will find, a crypto, will find crypto a game changer. Another is that the energy consumed by crypto mining pales against the energy consumed by currency distribution and the physical infrastructure. Um, yes, that is true. Um, if you look at the amount of te terawatts used by crypto mining and current financial system, our current financial system, yes, it is negligible. But you also have to look at the services provided by big banks and institutions compared to DeFi. Um, honestly, in my opinion, DeFi barely scratches the surface of what financial institutions have to offer. And for that reason, they are smaller in comparison. And naturally, it follows that they use much less energy. Um, but I don't think looking at raw energy consumption is the right way of looking at it. Um, and that is because you can't underestimate the power and the influence and importance that investment banks hold. Uh, absolutely gargantuan companies need constant money to sink into either R&D, distribution and innovation, you know, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. Uh, these companies just need an obscene amount of money to do what they do. And they would not be able to function without investment banks. Imagine a world without Amazon or Apple or Microsoft, you know, Windows, the iPhone. It's just too big to be undermined by something which has barely seen the light of day um, in, a, in both a regulatory point of view um, and in, in the experience it's had being used by, by the general public. And until DeFi can provide similar services or provide these at a much cheaper cost to centralized systems like you know, big investment banks, they will never come close to overtaking, overtaking our current system. Won't DeFi always be unregulated and therefore unprotected as far as investors are concerned? Since by definition or definition, there are no trusted third parties, banks, custodians to stand behind it. Put another way, if DeFi cannot, indeed should not be regulated. Why should any serious financial institution or government continue to be involved with it or infuse investors to do so? Yes, I agree with you. Um, it's not within any government's interest or it's not within the American government or UK government's interest for investors' money to flow from big banks to DeFi. And that's partly for tax reasons. Um, the government doesn't get their cut, but also it doesn't want to see that amount of money being effectively snatched from right underneath their noses um, when they don't have any power or influence in that decision. It's um, almost quite political where you're, you're taking that amount of money and influence from a government and they have absolutely nothing they can do about it that conveys a very powerful message to people who have been almost led to believe the government is unquestionable or very powerful. So that is one, that is one argument to be made. Um, as to whether it cannot or should not be regulated, um, that's a personal opinion. But what I think is if DeFi is to become mainstream and is to provide competition to our current financial system, it absolutely should be regulated. And that's A, for the safeguarding of its customers or clients, and B, it's so, <clears throat> and B, it's so, and it's so customers have trust in the system. It goes both ways. It cannot just be, it, it cannot just be customers having trust or them being safe the system has to effectively guarantee their safety and clients have to go into business knowing that their money is safe or knowing that they won't get defrauded. Um, and the only way that's going to happen is through stringent regulation. I mean, if you see all the regulation around the big banks now, um, people still, you know, and this is because 2008 has left a bitter taste in their mouth, people still don't have 100% trust in our current financial system. And I don't see DeFi um, as a solution to that, if you ask me. Have you heard of Nexus Mutual, 
a blockchain-based solution to mitigate smart contract risk by sharing risk together. The Nexus community, especially essentially a democracy, will decide on valid and invalid insurance claims and handle them on a case-by-case -case basis enforced by Ethereum's smart contract system. Um, I haven't heard of this, but the way I see this working is as long as no one party has a majority stake in the mining power of the Ethereum network, um, the system effectively works. Now, the problem is when you have a 51% attack where one, where one party has the majority power in the network, then things go a bit pear-shaped. Um, but in, on paper, it sounds like a, a nice idea. Um, but insurance is a very, very complicated business with a lot of effectively counterparties and syndicates underwriting, writing, and buying claims from each other, or sorry, buying uh, contracts from each other. Um, it sounds like it would need a vast amount of concentration of power from the network to support it. But I would, I will definitely read up on that after the presentation because it does sound very interesting. Yeah, I would also like to add about insurance companies um, and syndicates is that um, based on past history and whenever there's been a big catastrophe that has made insurance companies have to pay out sums uh, to claimants, uh, like, for example, um, things like the Exxon Valdez tanker uh, or the oil rig that um, uh, I think about 30 years ago in the North Sea that caught fire. Um, in those circumstances, I think this is where jurisdiction comes in, uh, primarily because, for example, those contracts for the insurance were done uh, on a particular exchange like the Lloyd's Insurance Exchange. Um, and therefore, all those parties uh, started going at each other in litigation for many years before they actually paid out uh, to each other. And therefore, I think whilst Nexus Mutual is um, a good idea in many respects, I think when it comes to people actually having to pay out against the risk that they've insured, um, often there is a lot of resistance and they will want to tie that up in legal um, process. And essentially the question then becomes which, which legal process, whose legal process and which jurisdiction does this sit under? Um, so I think there are some technical issues with that. Um, uh, and I think uh, having seen, you know, human behavior over the years with insurance claims, um, I would say that Nexus Mutual may work very well for relatively small claims. But if you had a massive claim of a few hundred million dollars, I don't think that that system uh, would withstand that shock. So that's kind of my view on it. And again, it is a personal view. But um, uh, we shall move on. I hope that answers your question, um, anonymous attendee. Uh, Sean Titley says, yes, thanks. I agree money supply is a bigger issue. Um, that is a topic which is up for debate. Um, I've stated my personal opinion um, in the past, but that is a discussion which is definitely worth having. Thank you for being an active participant in this presentation. Anonymous attendee says, do you think that governments will eventually introduce much more regulation when they figure out how? Um, the obvious, well, the apparent answer to that is yes, because one would think, well, yes, they can tax it. Yes, they can protect its users. Obviously, they would regulate it. But on the other side of the coin, you really have to think of how big or small, I should say, uh, DeFi is in comparison with all of the other things the government are doing. Um, it's, it's almost widely known that the regulators are two steps behind everything that's happening. Um, an example I can use for the computer scientists is um, as new technology and as new software comes out, um, more methods of either hacking that software or more malware gets written, more computer crimes or more, more kinds of computer crimes can be committed. And it's a really, really strenuous task for the regulators having to keep up with all of that. And the same goes for financial services. As new financial products get, get structured and released for investors, um, as, new, as new ways of investing are discovered, different, different ways of exploiting those come to light and different ways of fraud to be committed are also, are also per, per, perpetrated. So the regulators will have to constantly be on top of that. Um, as well as many other things which are happening in the world right now. 
So I don't think DeFi is a top priority for the government at the moment because the money they can collect from that is not that much if they can even figure out how to do so. And uh, I go back to my argument about investment banks and the power they hold. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier, which I should have, was the very first investment bank was used to effectively fund government infrastructure projects in America. Um, and how that ties into all of this is governments, the financial regulators at FCA are basically focusing their full attention on investment banks. A, because regulation or macro prudential regulation of the sector is a top priority for ensuring trust in the system. And B, well, be that as it may, um, they may be thinking of touching on DeFi, but as it stands, funding those projects and ensuring there's no malpractice in the industry will always have precedence over transacting money through computers. Stephen Castell says, the government is unquestionable when it comes to regulation for financial safety, that's called democracy. If DeFi becomes regulated, it becomes non-decentralized. The issue is indeed trust. Well, one interesting point I'd like to raise is while things may be decentralized on paper, in reality, they are centralized. So if you take the internet, for example, yes, the internet is effectively made up on a, of a bunch of nodes or systems hosting websites, hosting, hosting various pages which gets traffic through them. In reality, the vast majority of data, you know, exabytes of data are flowing through Google, Facebook, and Amazon Web Services. That's three, that's three companies or three parties, um, which in practicality, I think most people would agree that is a centralized system, although on paper it is decentralized. And the same goes for cryptocurrency. So yes, on paper, there are thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes um, working in collaboration to mine Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, in reality, we have a very, very small amount of huge players who have got warehouses full of computers. Um, and therefore, they are the ones who control most of the mining power, which is why 51% attack is not unlikely. Um, although it would be within nobody's interest to execute one, mainly because people would realize their currency is now worthless as the big player would decide what happens with the network. But that's another topic. So back to, back to the non-decentralized. Um, it effectively already is non-decentralized. It is centralized due to the large amount of traffic throwing flu, throwing flu, flowing through select individuals or parties. Thank you for your question, Stephen. Okay, conscious of time, uh, we've got uh, five minutes left. Uh, are there any other questions anybody would like to ask? I assume not. Um, so, I would like to take this opportunity of thanking you all for attending this webinar. Um, it has been uh, interesting answering some of your questions, um, as well as actually doing the content for this and the research we had to do. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, Stephen Castell, one last minute question. So technical centralization, not legal centralization. Yes, I think that is what Georgia was intimating is that the network on which all of this sits uh, is in loose terms is, is a centralized network and has hubs within that network. Um, but also if you consider things like the um, blockchain itself, if you're trading using uh, exchanges, then essentially the transactions are happening through a, a platform um, and therefore it is also a form of centralization. So I think we can never really move away from a certain degree of centralization, technical mainly, but also legally, I think there is a big minefield out there with decentralized finance. And I think that is something that the lawyers will spend many years trying to answer and fix. So again, thank you very much everybody for joining this webinar. It has been a pleasure uh, having you all here and I hope you all found it uh, interesting. Um, and uh, insightful. 
So over to you, David or Dalit. Hi, it's David. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. That was really interesting. Um, we're going to release the video in a few days and you will receive an email from Eventbrite with a YouTube link. Um, yeah, so thanks again, everybody.